Next speaker is uh, principal at D-Land Studio, doing research on landscape and large-scale urban infrastructure. So we have Susan Drake. Here we go. Can I just do this? Okay, good. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so, so Jamer actually did a, a very nice job in setting up for my talk because I also have some inspiration coming from uh, Powers of Ten. Um, but I also um, uh, sort of take issue of, of, well, actually, it's not even taking issue, but, um, but I was struck by uh, his point of um, in having his students identify the point of intervention um, where you can have the most impact because I've never been able to decide. Um, and so in my practice, I've tried to um, set up a, a, a sort of a, a discussion um, across scales where we, we understand um, how we can intervene at these different scales very specifically by bringing together a group of really smart people um, who have very different backgrounds. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some, some of the projects in our office. And, um, and I am thinking at a very different kind of scale, as you can see by this um, map of the globe as the daughter of a geophysicist. This you know, truly inspires me. Um, but, um, but one of the things that we do a lot of uh, work with in my office is, is really thinking about climate change um, and how we need to be rethinking infrastructure to make cities more resilient to, um, to climate change issues. So in, in uh, thinking about, I'm going to actually show you a few projects in New York City, but, um, but in thinking about these projects, you can see how New York um, is, is sort of this gray mass. Um, it's very developed. It's very paved. Um, but if you look at Eric Sanderson's um, Manhattan Project, um, this shows the original condition of the island. It used to be a very green, verdant ecosystem. But you know, over the years, it's developed into a different kind of green ecosystem. It's based on commerce. We also um, have some incredible visionaries um, that have done some amazing work here. Um, Robert Moses creating um, our, our uh, highway systems, um, but uh, you know, is, is seen in some contexts as the villain, but in other contexts, he can be seen as a true hero because he did also design a lot of playgrounds and parks all over the city. Um, but really, sort of, I would say more of my hero would be uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and not because of his picturesque. Um, parks, but because of the brilliance of the way he combined that sort of green infrastructure with um, transportation infrastructure. Riverside Park actually sits over rail lines. It's a perfect sort of example of the kind of, of, kind of uh, layered um, green infrastructure systems that, that we're all trying to create now. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting to look at, at um, how natural systems and uh, urban systems overlap overlap in the city, um, Collect Park, um, this is actually an image of the same view. Um, Collect Park is currently paved. Um, the Parks Department is planning to put in a fountain to actually show some of the expression of what was there, which was a, a big wetland. Um, but it's also interesting, this is a, a map of the same area. There's a whole sort of hydrologic um, structure that exists underneath the ground in the city that we're really not conscious of at all. And instead, we take that infrastructure and we put all that water into this series of, of engineered pipes to just sort of take it away. So the, the other sort of aspect of thinking about these, these water infrastructures is the, you know, that's sort of the water that's up, upland. Um, then we have the water that's actually coming from um, the harbor and, um, and the impacts of potential storms. This is actually um, a photo montage that one of my um, Harvard students put together of the water level in 19, is there a step here? Um, in 1938 of, um, from the, the hurricane. It was a huge hurricane and it, it impacted the whole East Coast. But it's interesting to think that, you know, it doesn't, even if we sort of discount notions of, of climate change, which, you know, of course, I believe is happening, um, we still have to think about the fact that the city needs to be made more resilient to these impacts. This happened in 1938. You know, it's a 100-year storm. It's been a while, right? So there is the potential for this kind of storm to happen again, and you can see the fabric of the city that that, that might affect. So, so I'm actually looking at a few projects today, or I'm going to show you a few projects today. Um, um, in d these different parts of the city, uh, three in Brooklyn and uh, one in Manhattan. 
Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the Gowanus Canal Sponge Park, which in the speed dating I told you all about last night, or told you in like two seconds. Um, but basically, New York City has this um, problem uh, or this system of dealing with its stormwater, where sanitary sewers and um, storm sewers combine um, with even a 20th of an inch of rain. And so what that means is that 400 million gallons of this combined sewage effluent go into New York Harbor every single week. So this is a big problem, and it's something that we can deal with with green infrastructure. So we, we thought about creating a system of, of open spaces around the Gowanus Canal and thought, if I go into a community meeting and start talking about a series of wetlands and, and uh, uh, swales, they're going to crucify me. So I thought, we need, to, we need to think of another way of presenting that information. So we said, what does a wetland do? It absorbs the water. It's like a sponge. So we came up with the idea of the sponge park. So in the area, it's, it's cur currently pretty impervious. And you can see that, that there's a lot of stormwater going over the surfaces. And you can also see that the edge of the canal is pretty, um, pretty rough. But it is used for recreation. This is the Gowanus Dredger's Boathouse. Um, the, the watershed um, is fairly significant. It's interesting to look that the, the blue and the, and the green actually don't overlap. One is the watershed, and one is the sewer shed. So there's an administrative area of inputs. And then there's a natural natural area of inputs. So we came up with the notion of, uh, of this sponge park that would exist to um, take all of the water as it ran down the end of the street. Um, and one of the things that's really uh, important to understand in New York City is that everything is regulated. The stormwater is regulated. The shade over the water is regulated. The soil, you know, the top five feet of the soil are regulated by one agency. Below that is regulated by another agency. Um, a federal agency controls this, um, this soil. It's, it's just crazy. You know, the DOT is controlling the street end. You have to coordinate with the fire department. So it becomes this really complex, pretty interesting maze, actually. Um, but we looked for places where we could actually carry this out and thought about how we might create this sort of holistic system or framework for the implementation of these systems and calculated really how much um, open space or spongy space we would need to absorb all of the water um, from one of these storms. So you can see here's a, a, a vision of what we think that might look like. Um, and then this, um, I want to say importantly, is the first implementation. We got a grant from the New England Water Pollution Control Commission and also um, some money from city council and from our congresswoman to actually do the first pilot. So this is an image of that first pilot that will start construction in the fall. Um, and now I want to talk about um, some strategies for the BQE, Brooklyn Queens Expressway in Brooklyn um, and Queens. <laughs> um, so, and I want to just read this quote, and he, Robert Moses, spent a lot of time looking down at it, watching the cranes and derricks and earth-moving machines that looked like toys far below him, moving about the giant trench being cut through mile after mile of densely packed houses, a big black figure against the sunset in the late afternoon, like a giant gazing down on the giant road he was molding. Now, this is the vision of what he proposed, and this is what we got. So there's this trench, the six-lane six highway running through um, Cobble Hill. Now, it does skirt around Brooklyn Heights and form the first historic district. But you know, the, the formation of the, canal, of, the, uh, I'm sorry, of, the, of the BQE was not without its impact. So we started to look at asthma rates and physical activity and obesity rates and poverty rates and, and start to think about the correlations. Um, and then also economic disparity on either side of the, can, of, I keep calling it the canal. It's like a canal. It's a sunken space. Um, the trench, and then also areas of social conflict that exist in relation to, um, to the trenches. Um, we looked at the uh, existing conditions as an infrastructural barrier, um, just the, the road geometry, and then thought about how we might start to add layers um, that provide sort of a more productive infrastructure, adding planting beds and bike lanes, permeable paving, um, green walls, and more open space. So this is a, um, a condition of the BQE in Williamsburg. We're currently working for Councilwoman Reyna um, to try to envision a park um, in Williamsburg and thought about some of the structural issues and where it was most feasible to actually do this capping. There's some places where you know, we needed to have a thin deck in order to meet federal highway standards. So you know, we couldn't really do the cap um, because of the spanning on the lower 
on the lower diagram between um, South Fifth and Broadway, but you can see on the upper areas we could. And one of the great advantages of, of the program that we proposed, which is this recreational program in the center, is that we're using a, um, a turf field, which has a really thin profile, and then really concentrating the plantings um, that needed a deeper uh, soil profile on the edges. So we were able to add a lot of recreational spaces for the target audience of, of the teenagers that are likely to get involved with the gang violence, bridge this, this uh, gap where you have you know, the Dominican gangs on one side and the Puerto Rican gangs on the other side and sort of you know, erase the, the defined barrier, uh, make it safer for kids to go to school because there are schools that, um, that, or there's school districts that cross the, uh, cross the canal, I mean cross the, the trench, I keep saying that. Um, so here's a vision of what it looks like um, now and then our vision of it capped with these new recreational opportunities. Part of the park is, is there's a current park space on either side of the trench, and it's really not used. Um, occasionally, there's some junkies there, but it's pretty, um, pretty underused. So we're imagining that we turn it into the BBQ-E. We, we add this active use of this um, family barbecue space next to the soccer field. And then we have these minimally used um, handball courts, and we're imagining that this could become a place for the community, a building that can actually have um, um, recreational component and, uh, and more uh, community uh, facilities. So then another area in, um, in Cobble Hill and Carroll Gardens, I'm um, thinking about how we might actually make this uh, productive infrastructure sort of uh, attractive to the city in terms of envi its environmental gain. Um, we used U.S. Forest Service data to show that um, in 10 years, just the planting of 360 street trees would yield a 10 million dollar, I mean, sorry, a 50 million dollar gain in terms of oxygen production and um, uh, recycling of water and uh, contribution to shade value. So it's, we use this data actually to bring a lot of federal money into the, the community. So you can see here's our, our 360 street trees, and that would have this huge impact. But then you can imagine that what kind of an impact actually even having this whole park um, would have on the, on the neighborhood. Um, so here's the before, and then an image of what that might look like after. There are a lot of existing park resources that would get connected into this. This could connect into Brooklyn Bridge Park and make a whole sort of sinuous greenway through, through the borough. Um, so the last project I'm going to talk about, and I'm trying to talk fast because I think I have limited time, um, but is the MoMA Rising Currents Project. This really looked at sea level rise and climate change. Um, so working off of work that was done by, um, by Guy Nordenson and uh, Adam Urinsky and Catherine Sievit, um, uh, uh, five different design teams were asked to look at different parts of the of New York Harbor, and I was on a team with, um, with ARO looking at Lower Manhattan. We all um, had studios out at PS1 and um, started to investigate how we might manage uh, sea level rise issues. So it's interesting to look at the um, coastline of New York City and how much it's changed um, over the last few hundred years. So looking at the shape in 1650, you know, it was very good for the ecology. It wasn't so good for shipping. You know, as, as commerce increased, you can see there was a hardening of the edge. You know, it was increasingly you had this bulkheaded um, condition and these um, slip spaces where the boats could actually drive right into the, into the uh, city. And then by 1960, you had this correlation between these finger piers and the streets. But then by 2010, a lot of that land got filled in and you ended up with this kind of recreational barrier um, to the, the water. So we started to think about that edge morphology and also the value at risk. Um, this is the line of uh, six foot sea level rise, which is what project, uh, scientists project um, over the next, uh, I think it was 80 years. Um, and then um, this inner line, which is even scarier, um, is the line of the 18-foot uh, uh, Category 2 storm surge. So you can see it's actually pretty similar to, if you remember the last diagram, it's similar to the 1650 water line, the line of that 18-foot um, Category 2 storm surge. So we thought that we needed to create a reciprocal system where we're thinking about how the salt water could come in and then go out again, and then how the fresh water, the, rain, the rainwater, um, could go out. So again, thinking about the CSOs, and actually that red <clears throat> Each one of these red um, uh, arrows is a CSO outlet. So we came up with this system. It was sort of a trifold system of, um, actually I'll say it's a, it's a, it's a 
a dual system of the series of, of upland streets that, that help to manage the fresh water and then an edge condition that helps to manage the, the force of the storm surge. So here you can see we took, the, uh, we took over the streets, um, we moved all of the utilities into waterproof vaults underneath the sidewalks, um, created these sponge slips to allow the water to go out to the edge very quickly, and then this whole series of, of transverse paths that might go through um, this new sort of wetland edge condition. So here you can see our vision of a new resilient city. And then, you know, this, how this might fit into a new resilient and active harbor and then how that might fit into our ecological region, going back to our powers of 10. So thank you very much. I think it looks really fantastic. And I can see that in Sweden, uh, they do a lot of this. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Malmö, where David and I live close by, uh, they had a problem being an old harbor city uh, with a lot of sort of uh, in dying industries mm -hmm. around the whole thing and uh, they really worked on the uh, planting in sponge parts mm -hmm. in, in the western harbor as they call it which is in a, a sustainable area as well so, but I, I wonder is the 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 city council or the, the 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 city of new york are they interested in doing these things or do you have to push them no actually they're incredibly receptive it's kind of amazing um well, I think, you know, I, I actually met the mayor a couple weeks ago at a party and I told him, I said, I have two years to actually, you know, get things done in, in this city because the people that have been put in positions of, in decision making positions in the city actually are incredibly receptive. And I've been part of a, a task force to start to think about how these, these systems might get integrated into new waterfront planning. And I've, I've been to, you know, hundreds of meetings over the last year about it. And um, I'm very friendly with people at the DEP, um, and they're, they're looking for ways to incorporate these ideas. Um, people at the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability are very eager. But then, you know, you go to implement the sponge park, and you end up with a middle, pers a middle management person at the DOT and a middle management person at parks saying, um, no. And so, so just to say, no, no, sorry, we're not going to do it. And then, so then I, you know, I, I know enough people on the, you know, to lobby from the bottom and to lobby from the top to sort of make things happen. And then once I've done that, then they're, they're all coming around. And the same kind of thing happens in the communities too, that you have to go out and have, you know, the 50 individual conversations with people so that they can have their own kind of, sorry, um, buy-in to, to owning it and to really, you know, taking a part in the whole sort of process. But I would say they're receptive. Yeah, so, yeah, so they're receptive and they're buying into it, but do, do they also buy it? Do they also put money in? They are buying it. I mean, the uh, city council actually put a lot of money into the, the pilot of the sponge park. Yeah. But of course, you know, the, the funding for my design work, yeah. I went out and I found it. I like applied for a really big grant and got it. I sort of took on a scientific model for the funding of my work, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a different model, but it's one that I think is that designers should really look at okay. because there is a lot of money out there, particularly when you start doing these, these designs that have a kind of ecological or have a, a health benefit. You know, there's, if you can start to make it more interdisciplinary then, you know, and sort of merge those ideas, then they're sort of different pots of money than we're used to going after as more academic designers. So, so. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good.